Grant and everybody else. If you would turn with me to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number five. Y'all remember that's where we're um, that's where we were last week, and we're looking at the B attitudes that, that Jesus. This is uh, what is known as the Sermon on the Mount that the Lord Jesus Christ preached. Um, what he was doing it, as he's looking at this, and he, he he's beginning to explain to his disciples and those that are listening that um, he, he's talking about the kingdom of God. He's talking about being a follower of Christ. He's talking about. Um, and, and what he's beginning to show us is, is that, that the, the main thing that God looks at, what he's concerned with, is the inside. That God, God sees us for who we really are on the inside, not what we do outwardly. And that's God's main concern. And, and so he begins to give us these beatitudes, these attitudes that ought to be in our lives sometimes, people say, these keys to happiness, true happiness in Christ. Um, and as he gives them to us, we'll notice a couple of things. We'll notice that they're kind of the opposite of what the world would tell you, right? They're kind of the... You know, we, we think of like money and fame as being happiness, but Jesus kind of, he, he, he kind of points us the other direction, and he's talking about a fulfilled life in Christ, which is the most important thing. So as we look at that, we're talking about, he's, as we're looking at it today, these are attitudes that Christians ought to have. It's also a good place for someone to check themselves up and say, do I have any of these attitudes? Are, are any of these things consistent with who I am? Do I, do, does this look like me whatsoever? Uh, to see if you're you are a follower of Christ, you know that's always good. We should all always, you know, um, to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, as the Bible says. Right? These are these are things that we should take very seriously as we look at them. So let's look. Let's read. Um, last week we finished at verse five, and this week we're going to go. We're going just going to go through verse six. So we're really going to focus on one verse, but we're going to look at some other scriptures. So we're going to move around a little bit. So just bear with me. So Matthew chapter five, verse number one, the Bible says, "And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain." And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, so this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Let's pray. Father, uh, we're so thankful for your word, God. Uh, we're thankful, God, that you brought us back here together one more time, Lord, to look at your word together, to learn of you, God. I pray, God, that uh, it would all be about you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that it would, uh, that your Holy Spirit would guide us through this, God, that you would give us understanding, Lord. We're dependent on you, not on us, God. I pray, Lord, that you would fix what needs to be fixed, God. I pray, Lord, that you would convict and save that one that doesn't know you here today. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. All right, so let's review in, in, in the first couple that we looked at. Remember in verse number three, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember we said that this is kind of like the opposite of being self-sufficient. Y'all remember that? How we said that um, for, for a person that knows Christ and, and knows God and knows who God is, we understand that we are... Um, we are not self-sufficient. We are all, like we said last week, we're, we're walking on the edge of a cliff. And just by God's grace that we haven't fallen off. God got me and you up this morning and he allowed me and you to come here in good health. We could have died in our sleep last night. We could have been in a terrible accident on the way to work. Or excuse me, on the way here to church and be paralyzed. We, they're, they're, uh, you know, our mental, you know, God could have took our mental capacity. You just, you just, we're, we're all, none of us are self-sufficient. So, so if you're poor in spirit... You have a very good understanding of who God is, the almighty, powerful, righteous God of the universe that not a molecule moves without his permission to do so. Um, and, and it's not puffed up. Somebody who, who's, who's poor in spirit, um, they're, they're, they're not puffed up and arrogant and proud. They, they, they are humbled uh, under the hand of almighty God. Um, somebody who's poor in spirit, whenever we, we talked about this too, we said that that person is... Um, we, we, he, that, that we're poor, we think about being poor monetarily, and we can kind of look at that that way, that, that this person is bankrupt uh, because of their sin. This person understands that, that they are truly poverty-stricken because of their sin. They have no hope of their own. That, that this person is completely dependent on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
um, this person does not um, have anything to offer is, is kind of the idea here. This person is, is completely destitute, nothing, nothing whatsoever because of their sin. Let's go a little further. He said this. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Um, he said those that, that mourn, th this is the person that's truly heartbroken over their sin. This is the person that understands that their sin ha has is what their, their problem is. That the, This is the person that realizes, a Christian that realizes that their sin is what separated them from Almighty God. And, and they realize that that sin, because of their sin, God's wrath w w was on them. And they were going to spend an eternity excuse me, an eternity in hell because of their sin, but for the goodness of Jesus Christ who redeemed them, who, who, who suffered on their behalf on the tree at Calvary, right, who became sin for them, and they became the righteousness of God in him. But that, that Christian is still brokenhearted over their sin. That Christian realizes that they still sin, and they're in a battle with sin every day of their life, and it truly bothers them, you see. Sin really does bother them. It's not, just, it's not a joke. It's not funny. It's not ha-ha, all shucks. It's something that really does bother them. It's something that really does, um, whenever they do fall short, like we all do so often, it truly is like it, it, it makes them feel uh, embarrassed and repentant. They, they really do want to go to God and ask for forgiveness and be amazed at God's goodness, right? The, 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 y'all notice that these things that Christ teaches are the opposite of what we would see. It's the opposite of the, um, the, the, like we said last week, oh me and the man upstairs got it all worked out, right? Yeah, I may do these things. I, I do run around and do whatever I want, but me and God have this understanding, you know, this very flippant with sin. Yeah, I do this and I, I do this and I do that, but me and God got it all worked out. No, that's, that's, that's foolishness. That's foolishness. That's not biblical. That's just foolishness. That's man-made foolishness. And we should never allow ourselves to get ever get sucked into anything like that, right? If you're, if you're, and and I think we probably can all relate to this at some point, Christian. I bet every one of us can relate to this at some, in somewhere. How we will begin to justify our own sin, and it'll begin to become all right in our eyes, right? We'll begin because we enjoy our sin, right? That's the thing, and that the Bible makes that clear. We do sin because we enjoy it, right? And we can all relate to that if we're honest with ourselves. And what we'll do is our sin will begin to lull us to sleep because we will make excuses for ourselves to live in that sin, Christian, okay? You'll make excuses for yourself. But see, God doesn't make any excuse for it. It's an abomination to God when we sin, okay? And God will punish us for that sin, Christian. I bet you can relate to that too. That God, God won't be mocked. You, you wanna, you want, you're, you're redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and then you want to go around that like a fool. God will not be mocked. God will punish you. God, you because the Bible says that God punishes you because he loves you, right? He says that you're not a bastard. You're not fatherless. That's what the Bible says. You, you, you have a father in heaven that loves you very much, and because of your sin, he will punish you because he will get you back on the path because he knows that's best for you, and he will not be mocked. So don't play games with God. We probably all, I bet we've all been there. I've been there, and I bet you have too, Christian. Don't play that game with God. And here's the thing. And if you go and you continue your sin, continuing in your sin, and you're living, you're doing sinful things, and you're doing however you want to, and then you say, man, it's been this long, and man, I'm, I'm all good. I'm all good. The Bible says if you have not been chastened by God, if you continue to sin and there ain't a thing in the world wrong with it, you had not been punished at all. That's a scary thing because that would lead me to believe that you are fatherless, that, that you don't have a father in heaven. He's not going to punish you if, if you if you don't know you because you're sin. Now, God can punish a non-believer if he wants to, but, but God does not discipline those that, that are not his. So there's another reason to be fearful. This person mourns over their sin. Over their sin, he said, "They shall be comforted." That's the wonderful thing about God. Whenever we go to Him, we're truly brokenhearted over our sin. He, he comforts us. He comforts us like a parent that comforts a child that's upset. You know, you ever, uh, you know, your, your children, whenever they do something wrong, and you um, you punish them however you see fit to punish them, and you can tell when they're really sorry. You know, once in a while, a kid really is sorry about what they did. Not always. <laughs> sometimes it's they're sorry they got caught, but sometimes you can tell the parent. You know, when they are truly sad and upset because of what they did and you know and then you swoop in there and comfort them right you see that that true repentance in the child and you and that's when you start to build them back up but, but don't beat yourself up over it it's over i punished you it's done i love you i know you did i know you're sorry you did it let's just don't do it again i love you very much you know y'all y'all see that god comforts those that are truly brokenhearted over their sin he comforts us and that comfort is it's worth more than silver and gold, man. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's nothing better. Just like that child, just like that small child when mom or dad is comforting them 
after they've messed up and they, they just they and, and you can just see how it just changes that you know that they, they feel that comfort that hug and it just it makes things all better whenever mom takes care of that baby that's hurt mom that, that that's the idea whenever God comforts us when we're truly broken over our sin um, verse number five he said blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth um, this person that's poor in spirit and this person that, 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 that realizes that they are completely dependent on Christ and they're truly broken hearted over their sin. Do y'all see how that would produce some humility in one's life? That would produce some meekness. Man, God saved me when I had nothing to offer him. And I still continue to sin and he still forgives me. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I, no matter how bad I've messed up, God is still always there and, and he loves me so much. Do y'all see that? that? That humility that that would produce? These build on each other. That, that humility... It's not strutting around like a peacock. It, 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 this person is truly humbled by the love of God. And, and, and because of that, there's a meekness in, in their life. There's a meekness in his life. There's a meekness in her life. Um, and, and here's the thing, and I said this last time. Um, and and you, you'll see how we talk about how these are the opposite of what we oftentimes see. Um, this meekness, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't look like... A, it doesn't prance around like a celebrity, you know, and, and, and that's the thing that we see um, this this modern era of like celebrity preachers and celebrity this and celebrity that. I, you know, I'm not saying they're all wrong for being famous, but what I'm saying is, is that 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 look at me mentality is not what God is looking for from us. I'm not saying they've all got a look at me mentality, but a bunch of them do. And it's, that's not what God. That's not the idea here. The idea here is to be pointing people to Christ, not look at me. Not, not do this and do that. Um, um, God wants me and you to be meek and humble. And then he said this. He said, for they shall inherit the earth. This one that is meek and is not after their own, they'll, they'll, their inheritance will be better than anything that any of us could ever imagine. Their, their inheritance, they have an inheritance that is not, not made of perishable things, but it's, it's prepared by God and it's waiting for them. All right, so now after we've looked at that, let's look at verse number six and let's think about a couple of things. <clears throat> poor in spirit mourning over their sin meek, humble and then he said this he said blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness so we see these first three this is a person that's empty the person that's poor in spirit the person that, that, that's meek the person that's mourning over their sin, they're completely empty. They have emptied themselves out because they realize that they have nothing to offer. And now it says, because they're empty, now it says they are hunger and thirsting after righteousness. Okay? Right, let's, so let's start here. This is not the righteousness that, that would come for me and you. This is not self-righteousness. This is not righteousness. This is a person that's hungering and, hungering and thirsting after the righteousness of Almighty God. This is a person that is in pursuit of of the one who gave himself for them, right? This person is desperate, like like really hungry. Like man, you don't really know what being hungry and thirsty is because we, you know, we God has been graceful and given us a time that we live in where we're all super spoiled when it comes to having our needs met, right? Where we we but 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 to be truly hungry and thirsty, truly seeking after God's righteousness. Um, Like we said a while ago, this is this is not self righteousness. God, God, these beatitudes. Jesus is pointing pointing us to something that is far higher and far greater than ourselves. Okay, um, I, I want y'all to think about something right here, and I, I'm not going. Um, I'm going to give you an example uh, of, and because as this person is is seeking after God's righteousness, there will be things that there will be results of that. There will be outward acts that, that, that you see as a result of this person in pursuit of God. Now that the actions that this person will, will, will go, that these righteous acts that will come out of this person are not a drop in the bucket when it comes to God's righteousness, but it'll be just a little peep. Y'all see that? Just a little glimmer uh, of that pursuit of God that they have. Um, and, and we've seen this. I, I, we've all seen it. Um, I can think of an example right now. So it's actually a person that's here today. And, and I saw them do this one time, and I and I was I was impressed because it, it, it was um, it, you know it, it, this person 
I'm not gonna call, I'm not gonna embarrass anybody or anything like that. But this person was that somebody came up and they were talking about a need that somebody had, a teenager that had a need. There was a teenager, teenager had been really working hard, but things hadn't really worked out. This person, um, they had a car, but they didn't have any tires on their car and that sort of thing. And this person didn't know who the teenager was. They had just, this person had just told them about it. And this person just said, hey, tell you what, I'll just tell them to go to this tire shop and I'll pay to pay to put some tires on the car. And that was it, that was all it was said. There was no fanfare, there was no look at me. It was a very private conversation. That was the end of it. Do y'all see that? Do y'all see that right there is not self-seeking. It's not look at me. It's I'm going to do something for somebody I don't even know because I heard there's a need for that person. Do y'all see that? That Now, that that's not, it was not self-righteous. It was not look at me. It was a quiet conversation. I was just kind of there, I guess, eavesdropping maybe a little bit. I don't know, being nosy, I guess. We probably, y'all can all relate to that, right? Um, but but do y'all see that? Do y'all just do that? That? That, that's just a, but that's just a glimmer. I don't want to give any of us too much credit because that's just a glimmer. This person is seeking after God. Okay, this person is seeking God. Let's look. Y'all look with me at Romans chapter number ten. I'm just going. We're going to read like two verses in Romans ten, just to, just as a jumping off point, and then we're going to look at Philippians three. And I want us to really focus there on this pursuing after God's righteousness. <clears throat> Romans 10, verse number 1, the Bible says this. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Now, right here, Paul's talking about the Israelites, and he's talking about how they've made all these rules, right? And, and, and the reason they did that was is because they were after righteousness. Probably the motive was probably right in a sense because they wanted to be righteous and upright because they wanted to, 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 to show that they love God and they have trusted God. But what he, they did was they went about to seek their own righteousness. They went about to seek their own righteousness instead of pursuing the righteousness that's of God. It's hard for me and you to wrap our mind around a God that would love us so much that he would give himself for us and redeem me and you based on no work of our own. That's hard for us to wrap our mind around. So that's why people, especially religious people, that's why they create these rules. That's why rules come. That's why women weren't supposed to wear pants. It was, a, it, it was I guarantee the people were well-meaning. It wasn't like meant to be ugly. It was just, it, it, it's hard for us to comprehend that. And then if you, you know, just like us, if, if, they, if there were some rules in place, um, we would follow the rules because we wouldn't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But, but um, that's why certain um, other, you know, that, that's why a lot of people are stuck on things like baptism. They say you have to say, you have to do this and do this and do this and then be baptized. And whenever you're baptized, that's, the, that, that's when you, know, you become a Christian, when you come up out of the water and all that stuff. They're, 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 seeking, they're, they're seeking their own righteousness. They look at me, I followed these rules, I did that, 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 and that, and that order, right? I did it in that order, and I did it, and they said, whenever they baptized me, they said the right words as they did it, so I'm, you know, I'm a Christian. They're, they're seeking their own righteousness. They, 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 they don't comprehend the righteousness of God. Um, and, and only God can show us that. So let's look now in Philippians chapter 3, and this is where we'll be just for a second, because we're going to get a really good look at this. Philippians 3. Philippians 3, we're going to start looking at verse number 7. Philippians 3, verse number 7. We've looked at this before, but we're going to go through um, verse number 14. Philippians 3, 7 through 14. The Bible says this. The Bible says, <clears throat> But what things were gained to me, these I have counted as a loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained, or am already perfect, or, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also has laid hold of me. 
Brothers, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper, upward call of God in Christ Jesus. All right, let's look at this, and, and, and let's slow down a little bit. So what he's talking about, leading up to verse number 7, Paul's giving all his credentials in Judaism. I was this, I was a circumcised eighth day, I was a tribe of Benjamin, I had this. I mean, he, he, he was giving all his credentials, all the reasons that he would have been been awesome. He would have had he would have been the guy. He would have been the biggest, baddest, you know, the, the, the biggest, baddest there was. All, all the credentials. He, his resume was the best. But then he said this, verse number 7, But what things were gained to me... These I have counted as loss for Christ. This person that's in pursuit of God's righteousness is not concerned with their qualifications, right? They're, they're not talking about, I'm the best singer. I'm the best speaker. I have the most education. I have whatever. Th that, that, those things, are, yeah, th those all, th those things are not bad in and of themselves, right? Th they're fine. But they're, but, but that's not, that the person in pursuit of God's righteousness is not concerned with that. The, 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 those things are none of their concern. They're not cons they don't go around saying, I've been a deacon for 35 years. That's fine. That, that's, not the, that's not the thing. That, that, that's not it. That, that, that's not what they're looking for. Right? He, said, I, he said, but what things were gained to me, these I counted as loss for Christ. He said that the, the, the things that, that add to my resume, that means nothing in the pursuit of, of Christ. Do y'all see how this thing is very God-centered? And, and, and not man-centered. Do y'all see that? Like, it's not about us. It's not about you in, in, our, in our pursuit of God. And he goes on in verse number 8. He said, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, through whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. He said, I count all things as loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, who I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Paul said all those credentials that I gave you all ago, in my, in my service to Christ, I've lost all of it. All those credentials that everybody hates me now because I, 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 I preach Christ. And he said, I don't care about any of it. I don't care about any of it. It doesn't mean anything to me. It's, it's rubbish. It's trash. And, and, and my only focus is, is Jesus Christ. Y'all see that? Y'all see how... How a, a person in pursuit of God's righteousness is, is, is God's righteousness is so high and lifted up in mine and your eyes that all the rest of it is just it just falls to the floor. Y'all see that? It just falls straight to the floor. It means nothing anymore. It, it's all about Him. It's not about us. Anything good that comes out of me is just is Him. It's a result of Him doing it. Y'all see that? It, this person in pursuit of God's righteousness. They are not concerned with, with themselves. They're not concerned with celebrity. They're not, you know, I, I've confessed when I was, you know, when I started preaching, you know, you'd have those thoughts of, um, those natural man thoughts of, man, I'd like to, you know, you'd like to be at the biggest church, you know, 10,000 people come and hear you preach and all that. And now, as thank God I'm more mature and, and older, I don't care about any of that, right? I don't, I, I don't care about any of that whatsoever. I, I would, uh, you know, I would be, Thankful to God if I was able to, if God let me preach here until I die, that would be thank. I would just, I would be perfectly content with that, you know, Amen. because it's about Him. It's not about us, right? And, and this, and you see these, these big pre. You'll see a big preacher at a. And, and I saw when I was reading about one today, and he, he was the big, he was the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, all that other stuff. And then he got caught in, in a sexual sin. He got caught in a sexual sin, and, and here we are a couple months later, and he's already back up. And, and rocking and rolling in, in big churches and got conferences and people are paying to go hear him and all that, you know. What is that? What, what? If, 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 if we're in pursuit of God's righteousness, if you hear me, if we're in pursuit of his righteousness, we will have God so high and lifted up and we will know that God is so far above any of us that we will know that when you mess up, when, when, when you find yourself caught up in a sin that can happen to any one of us in this room, right, the last thing that we'll be concerned with is getting back up on a platform and having everybody look at us. That'll be the last thing on our mind. Okay, the first thing on our mind, we, we will be repenting and, and, and looking to an almighty, holy, and a just God and praying for God to put people in our life to help get us back on track, okay? We will not be concerned with everybody looking at me and listening to me. And that will not. That will be so far down the list that it will not even be able to be seen. You see that? Because we will be in pursuit of His righteousness. We will be looking to God and not ourselves. We, it won't be about us. It'll be about Him, okay? 
And, and he goes on a little further right here, and he said, he said um, at the end of verse 8, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And here we go, listen. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, which is from rules, which is from outward appearance, which is from doing the things that everybody says I should do, which is from going to church every time the doors are open, which is from paying my bills, which is from uh, taking care of my family, which is from taking care of my spouse, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may, be, that I may grant, gain Christ and be found in him, not by my own righteousness, which is from following any rule or religious law that there is, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. He said that I may be found in Christ where the only, the only concern is being found in him and in your faith being in him. And that being so high and lifted up, Christian, that being so far above anything else that the rest of it is completely out of sight. All those other, the, 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 the righteousness of God will follow along far behind in your life. It'll follow along and people will see it. There's no doubt about that. But, but the, the, on the level of importance in, in your pursuit of God, that will be so far back and you will be so unconcerned with, with ourselves being, being the hero, right? It, it, it'll, it'll all be about him. We, we'll, we'll just hope that when they look at us, they'll see him. We'll just hope whenever we do something that, that overflows from God's goodness that, that they'll see God's goodness and they won't see ours. It, it'll all be about them. And we all, and I know that, and, and look, some of us worse than others, we, we all have a little bit of that where we want to be praised. Everybody does. It's normal to have that. Um, but, but we're going to fight against it. We're going to fight against that urge to want to be the, the, the hero, and, and we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna seek God help me. That's the good. God help me to pursue after you and you alone and not myself. Um, verse number 10, he said that I may know him. This is the thing. He wants to be found in Christ. He, he, he wants to, he won't, he don't, he's not concerned with his own righteousness. He, he wants the, the righteousness which is through faith in Christ. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He said, any means whatsoever, God. He said, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. He said, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. <clears throat> Brothers, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, which are ahead. He said, one thing I do, I hadn't attained anything. He said, but this one thing I do, I forget everything that's behind. He said, all the wins and losses. He said, all the good things and the sins and all that. He said, I, they're behind me now. I, I've left them behind. And he said, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Um, the Christian, their, their, their main concern is Christ-likeness. That, 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 that's the thing that they're in pursuit of. We win some and we lose some. We, we, we meet the mark best we can sometimes, and sometimes we miss it. But, but, but Paul said that, that either way, he said, I, I, I leave it behind and I just keep going. I just keep pushing forward. I keep pushing toward him, pushing toward that call. And, and, and it's Christ-likeness. That, 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 that's what he's after here. That, that the righteousness that is in him not the righteousness that is in us. Um, let's go back to, to Matthew 5 and we'll finish there. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, we said that as we looked at the ones before that, we said this person that comes to the Lord is empty, right? This person is completely empty. That they've emptied themselves. They understand that in and of themselves there is nothing there, right? That, that they're poured out. And then it says that they're pursuing after, pursuing after God's righteousness. And it says they shall be filled. They shall be filled by God and his righteousness. That hunger and thirst will be quenched by God and by Him alone in pursuit of Him. 
in, in, in real pursuit of him, right? As you pursue him, as you try to understand this Bible better, and we try to learn more about him, and, and as we pursue him in prayer, and as we pursue him by the things that we look at on our phones and the things that we look at on our TVs, as we pursue God's righteousness, right, Christian? You know what you need to be doing, what you don't need to be doing. You know what you need to look at and what you don't need to look at. You know, Christian, the lifestyle that you're living that you don't need to be living and the one that you do need to be living, right? We all know that. We, all, we know the substances that we should be putting in our body and the substances that we should not be putting in our body. We all know that. We all know that. In the pursuit of him, the Bible says that God will fill me and you up, right? God will fill us up with him, which is far greater than any of the rest of this stuff that we could ever be filled with, okay? And we're never going to hit the mark. Let me go ahead and get, let me spoil that one there. We're just going to be, we're going to press on to it until God calls me in home, okay? Um, this is something that's far greater than ourselves. God's righteousness is far greater than me and you. We want to be more and more like him. We want to understand him more. We want to give him all the credit all the time, Okay? Um, the Bible says this. The Bible tells me and you something very interesting. And as, and as we looked at those first three, and I'm going to close right here, but, but it'll take me just a second. So as, as we look at these first three, um, these that are poor in spirit, uh, these that are mourned because they're really brokenhearted over their sin, okay? And then you say this. You say, how do people come to churches or how do people go to churches all over Harrison County this morning, all over Georgia, all over the U.S., all over the world, um, and there's going to be people that are singing about, praying about, preaching about sin. They're going to be preaching about sin. And they're going to be preaching about what a, our attitude towards sin should be and how we should be brokenhearted over our sin, okay? And all over everywhere this morning, there are going to be people that, 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 that sit in on these songs and sermons. They're going, they're going to sit in. They're going to listen to them, right? They're going to listen to where Jesus Christ the God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that redeemed us Christians, where he said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who mourn, um, who, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are meek, particularly talking about that sin, those who mourn over their sin, those who, that are poor in spirit. They're going to hear these things, right? They, and there's going to be people in there that are living in sin. They are living in open sin in their life. They have things in their life that are not right with God. They know good and well they do. They know they're not right with God. And they're going to hear these things that God said, and they're going to leave out of the, the, the churches or wherever they're meeting at, they're going to leave out of there unchanged, right? They're going to leave out of there, and they're going to be completely unchanged by it. Why is that? Why do people sit and listen to these things, and they leave unchanged? Well, first of all, first of all, they're not broken over their sin. A couple of things. They've been either lulled to sleep by Satan where they're at, or they just simply don't believe it. Right? Because if me and you, if any of us in here, if we really believe that the wrath of God abided on us, if we died today in a car wreck out there, we would endure God's wrath because of our sin. If you really believe that, you would crawl to the feet of Christ and beg for forgiveness and salvation if you really believed it. Right? Everybody don't believe this. Everybody don't believe the Bible. Because if they did, people would be, it would be different. There would be a difference in people's lives. Okay? There would be a difference in people because of their sin. Or... They've been completely lulled to sleep, and they're in a, in a, in a state of uh, just, I don't know, maybe they're just numb to it. I don't know. There's not a whole lot of options it can be. Um, but nonetheless, I believe this Bible with 100% certainty, as sure as we're all sitting here today, that if you're in your sin apart from Jesus Christ, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, God's wrath abides on you. And, and there will be a reckoning because of your sin. That's what the Bible tells us. And the Bible tells us that over and over and over and over again because God knows that we need to hear it again and again and again and again. Um, and God's wrath is far worse than anything man you could ever imagine. Okay? The Bible says this, that because of our sin, we are separated from God and God's wrath abides on us and we're going to suffer because of it. Okay? And, and the Bible says that God the Son, Jesus Christ, came to earth. He was born a child. He lived a spotless and sinless life. Uh, the importance of that was is because none of us have ever done that. All of us are sinners, every one of us in here. Nobody's any better than the other one. Every one of us have fallen short. Every one of us have done despicable things. We've, we've had despicable thoughts. We've, every one of us. So that, that we're all on the, the same playing field right there when it comes to sin. Because of that sin, me and you are separated from God. Okay, well, some people say, well, nah, this person's... Had terrible things, and this person had, 
That, that's not the point. The, 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 the point is that the first sin you ever committed, you were on the same playing field as the serial killer. You were, you were a sinner separated from God. So that, that let's just get that out of the way. You're a sinner separated from God. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, he was perfect. And, and, and I believe that. And, and, and the reason he was perfect, let's go on a little further. The Bible says that he was arrested, beaten, mocked, spit on, and then he was crucified. He, he, he was executed. They were going to kill him, and they crucified him on a cross. They nailed him to a cross, and they hung him up for all to see, all on display. The Bible says this, that when Jesus Christ was hanging on that cross, that God the Father, he actually poured out his wrath on Jesus Christ. He actually punished Christ. When the Bible says he became sin for us, that means that very literally, God punished him for our sins. So that wrath that ab abided on us because of our sin, God actually poured that out on Jesus Christ. Okay, He endured the wrath of, of Almighty God on, on that cross, worse than anything me and you could ever imagine. The Bible says that after God's wrath was poured out on him and he endured what none of us ever could, the Bible says that Jesus Christ died. The Bible says he was brought down off the cross and then he was buried in a tomb. The Bible says on the third day, he arose again. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is alive today. He's up in heaven making intercession on behalf of Christians. The Bible says this. Whoever believes in Jesus Christ, whoever trusts in him, that means that God convicts them of their sin. That's what the Bible tells us, that the Holy Spirit is actually the one that shows us that we're a sinner, that, that actually convicts us and we are pricked at the heart to understand that I'm a sinner and I'm separated from God and Jesus Christ died for me. That person repents of their sin turns from their sin, asks God to forgive them of their sin, and puts their total faith and trust in Jesus Christ and his redeeming work at the cross. He endured the punishment for my sin, and he's alive today, which shows that his sacrifice was perfect. Why do people hear that and not move? Because they don't believe it. They don't believe it. If they believed it, they would run to the feet of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you that. I believe it. And I know a lot of you do too. And, that, and, 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 and you are completely dependent on Jesus Christ. You ain't no better than anybody else. But you have a Savior that is. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord, I pray you would trust Him today. I pray that God would convict you of your sin. And I pray that you would surrender to Jesus Christ. Trust in Him for salvation. Turn from your sin. It, it'll be a work in progress just like it is for the rest of us. Turn from your sin. Turn to Jesus Christ. Trust in Him. Become a follower of Christ. While we stand on our feet, they bring us the verse of the song. We're going to have a time of you can pray where you're at. You can come down here and pray at the altar. You can sing along.